drink this one? <laughs> Before I begin, I would like to say a couple of words of deep appreciation for the sponsors and the people who have put this program together. I have been involved in speaking publicly all over the planet and all over the United States. I've been conferences here, I've been conferences there. And I know how terribly difficult it can be to put a program like this together. And I have to say, I have tremendous respect and admiration for the people who have done this. Most of all, I have to respect their courage for dealing with a subject like this, where most of the elite leadership and the power groups of the world want this subject to go away. And these courageous young men who have put this together are brave and they deserve my respect and your admiration. And I want to say I thank you because I know what you can do. Now, I must explain something else to you. I never read from a script. I don't have a prepared script to follow. I get up on the stage and I talk to people like yourselves and I kind of mean it. I have so much material and I have such a problem of keeping it under the allotted time that I've been given. I have come today prepared to speak to you for three hours. I only allow one hour to get in there. So something's going to have to give. But bear with me, I'll do the damnedest job I can. And it's important that you see the photographs of the NASA pictures that I have brought with me. Now, my journey began 45 years ago. I began a journey that if I had known then what I know now, if I had known the pain, the anguish, the heartbreak that I was going to experience over these 45 years, I might not have started that journey at all. But here I am in Barcelona in 2009 with some of the most delightful people I have ever met. And looking back, I find that the journey was worth the effort. It was worth the pain, it was worth the heartbreak. And I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to see all of you out there. And this is such an encouragement to me that people are beginning to demand the truth. They know they've been lied to from the very beginning. And they want to know. And I'm going to hear this afternoon, hopefully, contribute one small vision to helping you understand and helping you know. Most of my adult life, or most of my first part of my adult life, I was a professional soldier. I was in the Army. I joined the Army in 1950 to avoid the draft. Ended up going to Officers Candidate School, and so help me God, while I was going to OCS at Fort Riley, Kansas, the North Koreans invaded South Korea, and the next thing I know, I'm on the front lines of Korea, being shot at by a bunch of pissed off Chinese and North Koreans who tried to kill me. And I have nothing against them. You know, I didn't want to kill them. Here I am. 1951 leading combat troops in Korea in one of the bloodiest wars we had ever had. And uh, the rest, I guess you could say, is history. <clears throat> I, led combat, I led combat troops in Korea in 1951. I spent 27 years on active duty, and I also in, was involved in the war in Southeast Asia in 1970 where I was part of an organization that gathered intelligence in the jungles of Southeast Asia, South Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. 
And let me tell you, some of those big years were rather harrowing. The most harrowing experience I was to have was when I was assigned to Paris, France in 1963 to what we considered in those days a plush assignment, a plum assignment. I was able to go to Paris, France, take my family with me and my children, went to high school in Paris. And uh, as I said, it was a plum assignment. I had no idea what I was to find when I got there. When I arrived in the summer of 1963, I arrived with a top secret clearance. When I arrived at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers in Europe, which was located at that time in a small town known as Rokincourt, right outside of Paris, my security clearance was upgraded to Cosmic Top Secret, which was then and still is today the highest level of security classification that NATO had. I had to have Cosby Top Secret clearance to work in shock, Supreme Headquarters Operations Center, the war room. I was a senior master sergeant at the time, and when I was assigned in shock, I was given the job of maintaining the duty roster. We worked on a 24-hour basis day after day after day. And I was given the job of running the duty rosters, and I worked in shop. And, and back in those days, let me tell you, the war rooms were somewhat primitive. You've seen pictures today, I'm sure, of the control centers of most major installations, like SAC in Colorado Springs. Everything is electronic. Everything is demonstrated on the wall, extensions just like this beautiful stuff here. Back in those days, we had teletype, we had field telephones, and if we wanted something on the display, we had to go up and take a pin and put it on the wall and show the controllers where this division was, where that Soviet regiment was, and so on and so on. Very good. When I arrived in the summer of 1963, I heard rumors about a study that was underway. Now, it interested me, it interested me because the study was about UFOs. And I was intrigued by the possibility. I was curious about UFOs, I had no idea then what they were, what they represented. But we used to discuss this in the shop, in the war room. The study was underway. What was it about? What happened? Well, it appears that on the morning of the 2nd of February, 1961, World War III almost began. And it was involved in the flyover of large numbers of circular metallic craft, flying in formation, very obviously under intelligent control. And they would fly out of the Soviet sector in the Warsaw Pact toward the West in formation at a high rate of speed and a very high altitude. And they would turn north over the English Channel, over the southern coast of England, and then they would disappear off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea. On that morning of 2nd February 1961, World War III almost began. The Soviets went on red alert. The NATO forces went on regular. Everybody was, you know, fingers on their triggers, thumbs poised above those red puppies. And it, World War III was just moments away. Within 20 minutes, it was all over. The objects flew, turned north, disappeared off the radar. It was all over. After this event occurred, a British Air Marshal by the name of Sir Thomas Pike, who was a Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe at that time. He was the Deputy to my boss, General Lyman Lendis, an American four-star general, who was known as SACUR, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. Air Marshal Pike says, I've had enough of this. 
These objects have been showing up regularly from time to time. And as I said, they almost triggered a war. Air Marshal Black said, we're going to have to come to terms and find out what the hell's going on here. I want to know. So he began a study. He initiated a study in shape headquarters that was to last three years. They published it and they issued it in the summer of 1964 while I was there working in the war room. They titled it an assessment, an evaluation of a possible military threat to Allied forces in Europe. So it had some pilot units. Just couldn't learn very much about that. An assessment, an evaluation of a possible military threat to Allied forces in Europe. I was working in the war room one early morning around 2 or 3 o'clock, and as I jokingly used to refer to it, the coffee was too black to drink. We read all the newspapers, magazines. Many of you have heard military life is about 99% boredom, broken up with 1% of sheer terror. And that's the way it used to be, and that's the way it probably is used to be. I'm sitting there nodding off in this American Air Force full colonel looked at me and he says, wake up. He went over to the vault. The vault he got was a walk-in safe. He opened the door and walked in and we kept classified documents in there. The colonel went over to the vault, the file, and pulled out this document and threw it on my desk and he says, read that, that'll wake you up. Ladies and gentlemen, my life changed. I opened the first page and I couldn't put it down. I read it and read it and read it, and I read it every time I was on duty in the war room. I was shocked, I was stunned by the implications of what I read in that study. <clears throat> and as I said, my life has never been ever quite the same. The study briefly, and I have to brief, briefly lay this out. I could talk two, for two hours about this, but the study simply concluded this. Is there a threat to Allied forces in Europe? Apparently not. They concluded that the planet Earth and the human race had been under some kind of survey or observation going on for hundreds if not thousands of years. They concluded in 1964 that there were at least four different groups coming here, observing us, surveying us, analyzing us, closely watching us, what we were up to, what we were doing. They concluded that there did not appear to be a military threat involved because the repeated demonstrations of incredibly advanced technology demonstrated to us that if they had been hostile or malevolent, there was absolutely nothing we could do. If they were evil in their attempt and they were hostile toward us, it would have been over a long time ago. So, the conclusion was there were four different groups involved. They had been coming here for a very, very long time. Apparently, they were not malevolent or hostile. The question was, what the hell are they doing here? Why are they here? And why are they interested in us? Well, they did not know in 1964 what their agenda or their motives were. And I will tell you honestly and frankly that even today, our authorities, our senior military, our national security people, still don't totally grasp what their motives are, what their agendas are. So this study in 1964 was simply a beginning for me. As I said, I was never quite being the same as and I, as I, I go to and say, I used to be a normal human being. And after I read that study and 
And once on my 45 years of research, I uh, lost all aspects of normality. I will be frank and tell you that over the years of my study and the material that I've learned and gathered has brought about in me a complete destruction of my old world view. My old world paradigm. The world view that I held since I was a kid growing up. Everything made sense, you know, I knew why we were here, where we were going, what was taking place. After I spent 45 years on this, it all collapsed around my knees. That was the destructive aspect of my personality. That was the part that changed me completely from the kind of human being that I had been before into the kind of human being I am today. Ladies and gentlemen, I am totally alienated. <laughs> no pun intended. I said in a couple of interviews and briefings that I have had for many, many years a love-hate relationship with the human race. One moment I love you, the next minute I hate you guts. One minute I adore you for your potential and the beauty of your music and your literature and your art, and the next minute I'm saying, to hell with all of you, Let's blow them up, let them blow themselves up, clean the mind it off, get rid of them. It's part of the struggle of having losing, having lost your old world view when your old paradigm collapses around your knees. <coughs> So the man standing in front of you here today is a, it's literally a human wreck as compared to what I used to be. But I feel pretty good about it. I lost all my old illusions. I opened my eyes and I saw the future. And I'm very happy about what I've seen. I've learned over the years from infinitely a variety of sources here, there, and everywhere. I didn't retire from the Army until 1976, and I kept my top secret clearance up until that moment. After I retired, I went to work for the Federal Emergency Management Agency and worked another 14 years for the U.S. government, where I had a top secret clearance. So I had a total of 41 years of federal service, you might say. But I've learned things over the years that literally still today stun me and shock me. I've learned that the human race is a hybrid race. I've learned that we are not merely alone. We have never been alone. We have had an intimate interrelationship with advanced extraterrestrial <coughs> intelligence from the beginning of our history. And let me tell you that that intimate interrelationship is still going on. This one race in particular apparently re-engineered us as a species about 200,000 years ago. What we are here today is what we call homo sapiens sapiens. You're an engineered creature. Your genetics has been manipulated. You're not the same that you were, and you were, are not the same of what your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be in the next hundred years. The human race is going through a transition. And it's more than a transition. It's what I've learned to be a transcendent transformation into a new race into a new future. And your descendants will be as different from what you are here today as what you are from old Australopithecus half a million years ago. That's not something to be afraid of. Something to look forward to. You're growing, you're developing, you're becoming a new race, you're becoming a new species. 
your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, and your descendants on in the next century or two have destiny in the stars. Don't you doubt that for a minute. This species, this race, this troublesome bunch of monkeys has a destiny in the stars. And we are a part of this infinite universe filled with intelligent life. And we have been from the beginning, but we're only now beginning to wake up and see it. Only now are we beginning to open our eyes and listen with our ears and look out there and say, all right, where have I been? What am I now? Where am I going? As I said, your destiny is in the stars. You, your generations to come, your descendants, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, will go out there and they will claim their rightful place. Hello. And then you are filled with intelligent life. Your place out there belongs to you. You have a right to that and you will claim it. There is so much to talk about. I've got some slides I have to share. Would you gentlemen please put the first picture up on the screen? I'm being assisted by some very wonderful people back behind the scene here. I'd like to start with a shot like this. this uh, pictures of this nature are sort of inspiring. It still gives you a glimpse of the community that you are a part of. A little glimpse of the stars out there. The nebulae. That's where you're from and that's where you're going home again to. That's where you belong. Next picture, please. I love these. They're so beautiful. I have some of these on my wall. So. But they, they inspire me. I look at them and I have a sense of recognition that I've been there before. And I know that I'm going back. But something happened in my country over the last few years that I'm very, very troubled by. Just last week, the United States celebrated the 40th anniversary of putting a man on the moon. Then we went through this whole hoopty doo of patting ourselves on the back and think, gee, wasn't that neat? Armstrong, Aldrin, you know, Collins up there in orbit. On the moon, aren't we great people? Aren't we magnificent? Look what we did. Well, let me tell you a couple of things that they did that you may not have ever heard about before. They took the few pictures they had, they had it all televised, everybody, Rock, Walter Cronkite and all of them were looking out. You know, Golly gee, isn't this great? Isn't this neat? They got a couple of guys on the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, my government, NASA, N-A-S-A, -A, which many of us in the United States say stands for never a straight answer. <laughs> proceeded to erase 40 rolls of film of the Apollo program. The flight to the moon, the flight around the moon, the landings on the moon, the walking guys here and there. They erased, for Christ's sake, 40 rolls of film of those events. Now we're talking about several thousand individual frames that were taken that the so-called authorities who did not have a right to see. Oh, they were disruptive, uh, socially unacceptable, politically unacceptable. I, I become furious. I'm a retired command sergeant major. I was never famous for having a lot of patience. The idea of when I found out that they had erased 40 rolls of film involving several thousand individual shots about what really happened up there, I became so furious that I, you know, I could have punched the director of NASA in the nose. I try to be, I'm not a dangerous man. I like to tell people that 
Like Henry Higgins in my fair lady, I have a milk of human kindness by the pork in every vein. So I really am a gentle man. But I have the capability, the potential of being rather dangerous and violent. And it is these lies and these cover-ups that I've learned about firsthand over the years literally infuriate me. And I hope it infuriates you. Because these authorities, these nitwits in high positions of power, who are proceeding to spend all the money that the American people make for their own use, for their own private programs, and then lie through their teeth about what the truth really is. Well, thanks to the idea that there were a few employees in NASA 40 years ago, even today, there are some good people working there, decent people, honest people. I have some film that they preserved that was not destroyed. Gentlemen, put up the next picture for me. This is a NASA photo. This is a follow up film. Apollo Systems 12, uh, roll number 50, negative number 7348. They were flying over the moon before they landed. They were, they went into orbit around the moon. As many of you, I'm sure, if you know the system, you know the procedure. They went into orbit around the moon, and while they were there in orbit around the moon, a number of anomalous artifacts began showing up, showing interest in them. Next picture, please. Ah, this picture was taken by Neil Armstrong. While they're looking out of the window of their little craft, this object flew by. There's the moon in the background, of course. There's this object that flew by the window of that little craft that they were riding in. Neil took the Hasselbach camera that he had, put it up the window, and snapped this picture. Next picture, please. <clears throat> ah, NASA Apollo 12, roll 51, negative number 8653, eight, something like that. Now, this is a good sized object. This is several hundred feet in diameter that came up next to the lander, flew along beside them for a time. The guys in the Apollo crafts put their camera to the window and snapped the thing. And I've always jokingly said there were guys inside of this taking pictures of an asset. <laughs> we were photographing them, they were photographing us. <laughs> Next picture, please. Photo NASA Apollo Systems number 14. Apollo 14. Roll 70. Negative. What is it, 9827, I think, or 8827? This is the Landsberg crater on the moon. The guys in orbit above the moon were particularly fascinated by Landsberg. They had been given a special assignment to take pictures of Landsberg because the crater, which they designated as Landsberg, had things going on in the crater that were very anomalous. <clears throat> there was a construction going on. There were enormous uh, facilities in the middle of the crater up there. So they were specifically designated and signed to photograph Landsberg to see if they could figure out what the hell's going on down there in the crater on Landsberg. <coughs> While they were looking at Landsberg, this object happened to uh, express interest in them and flew by. Now this line is an artificial line that was drawn to show you the, the the, date, the direction that this object was going. This is a good sized object flying past the uh, Apollo line. <clears throat> God, I'm so glad that some of these were saved. I still get fancy. 40 rolls of film was taken, and they erased them. Anyhow, next picture, please. It's the same photo of Landsberg, but the next negative, 9838, 
of this object here flying by. This picture. Ah, now we're getting into some nitty gritty. I'm going to give you just a brief little bit of history here. Back in the early days of NASA and the Apollo program, I got this picture from the Japanese Space Agency, the Japanese NASA. They have a tremendous program going over there in Japan. You know, the Japanese are bright people. So the Japanese Space Agency had signed a contract with NASA years and years ago to buy copies of every picture NASA took during the Apollo program. And I'm sure the Japanese paid a sizable amount of money for this, for this contract. And as the films were developed and the photos were made and they shipped them off to Japan, and the Japanese have a tremendous reservoir of good, original NASA pictures. They bought them, they paid for them. Now this photograph was released by the Japanese Space Agency, and you can see the Japanese writing here. This was taken by Apollo 13. Now you're all familiar, I'm sure, with Apollo 13. That was the aborted mission that was going to the moon to land, and they had an accident on the way. They couldn't land. They damn well barely got back. While they are on the way to the moon, here's the moon, a number of things began happening. Some strange objects were appearing outside the windows of the spacecraft. And guys, they grabbed their hassle black camera and started taking pictures. This photograph shows three different objects here. This looks like a circular object with an enlarged dome on top. This is a smaller object than a circular kind of this spacecraft. But coming in from the right margin of this particular picture is this. Next picture, please. Here we are. This is a blow-up of the positive in photograph. And here is a blow-up of the negative of this object here. Ladies and gentlemen, this particular object is five miles long. And I'm tempted to use, to use the term of uh, big mother. No pun intended, but the, you know, it appears to be a mothership. It's gigantic. Five miles long. And here these are NASA guys are up there in this little little camp, Apollo capsule. And they look out their window and they see something that's five miles long. It shakes them up a little bit. When they got back to NASA with these pictures, it shook them up a hell of a lot. Next picture, please. Ah, this is the next sequence. Here, this large mother has moved into the middle of the frame, and something else has shown up over here, which has been estimated to be two miles long. But this really upset the guys. I've never been able to find out which one of the three Apollo members of the Apollo 13 crew would admit to ever having taken these pictures. Because as you know, the Apollo astronauts were threatened with their lives. I kid you not, they were threatened seriously. They even threatened their families if they ever divulged any of the information that they knew. Next photo, please. Now, here we are. Here's the big mother. Here's the other one, two miles long. Here's a, a picture of the positive. This is the negative. This mother is five miles long. Up here you're seeing what appears to be two circular objects either arriving or departing from that particular big ship. I can almost understand why the authorities in NASA, why the authorities in the space program didn't want this information to come out. They were frightened. They were stunned. They couldn't deal with it themselves, and they figured it 
If they couldn't handle it, you couldn't handle it. There would be social disruption, I believe, is one of the terms they use. There would disturb the body politic, I believe, the term they use. So they clamp the lid down on this, and it's still down. And it's going to stay down, I'm afraid, for some time yet. Until people like yourselves and people like me and the rest of them here on the stage. By pushing and prodding and chipping away at this lie and this secrecy, will eventually we will succeed. And don't you doubt that for a minute. Ah, now I'm in for you read him for another photograph that I think will shock you some. In 1980, NASA. Never a straight, never a straight answer. Launched the Voyager program to Saturn. They launched this little mechanical spaceship filled with cameras and film and so forth. Wanted to go to Saturn because something had been going on in the rings of Saturn, around the moons of Saturn, that didn't make a lot of sense. Some anomalous events were taking place in Saturn near Saturn, at Saturn. So they launched the Voyager in 1980. The pictures they got back from Voyager was so stunning and so shocking that they just locked them up in the safe. Fortunately, I met and developed a friendship with a retired NASA scientist by the name of Norman Brooklyn. Norman Bergman worked for NASA for about 30 years. He was a technician, a scientist on the Voyager program to Saturn in 1980. Norman decided, after waiting a number of years, for NASA and the authorities to be candid and honest and forthright and tell us what they really found out at Saturn. And Norman got so frustrated, he wrote a book. I couldn't get it published in the United States. No American publishing house would even touch it. Norman Bergman had to go to Scotland, for God's sake, to Aberdeen to get his book published. And he did publish it. He did succeed. He got his book. It's a piece of genius. It's a beautiful piece of work. And the things that they photographed near Saturn appeared in print for the first time. This is the A-Ring of Saturn. Yeah, I think you're all familiar with what Saturn looks like. It's a beautiful planet. This is giant, it's a big one. But it's got rings all around. Well, this is the A-Ring, and here is an object that is self-luminous, obviously artificial, larger than our moon, that seems to be moving all around throughout the rings of Saturn among the, the moons of Saturn. The Saturn's got couple dozen moons. This object here, as I said, larger than our moon, moving all around apparently under intelligent control in the rings of Saturn. Now, try for a moment, if you can, to imagine a kind of a technology that is capable of constructing something larger than our moon, that's artificial, that moves around wherever it wishes to go, that's probably got several thousand guys inside it, that is shocking to some people. Next picture, please. Ah, this is the piece de resistance, I guess, is the French thing. Here you have another self luminous, artificially constructed object, circular in shape, larger than our moon, that is also moving here, there, and everywhere throughout the rings of Saturn and among the moons of Saturn. You know, it's got to be intelligence of work. But this is this is the one that really blew the, the NASA people on the Voyager program out of the water. This object, this is an object, guys, is two thousand miles long. It's four hundred miles in diameter. 
and it's an artificial, artificially constructed. Norman calls them an electromagnetic vehicle. He says they appear to be making the rings. This is one of the one of the rings that's out. I think mean, this is a B ring. Bergman says he thought they were probably making the rings. I said, Norman, you ever consider the possibility they may be mining the rings? Because I think the rings are probably rich in nutrients, minerals probably. In an incredibly advanced civilization, I think we can work out some system of mining those rings for all the minerals that are up there and utilizing them. Because space is filled with wealth, energies of all kinds. They never have to dig another hole in the ground like we do down here. Space is filled with, with energy. This is 2,000 miles long, and here on this end, there seems to be something like an exhaust or a flare of energy of some kind. It's probably a result of uh, engines of some type inside this thing. But whatever it's doing, it's there, and uh, it's, it's a recognition and a representation of an advanced intelligence. And that's one of the things they don't want you to know, that we are confronting and relating with an intelligence that's so far beyond our own. We're looking at and talking about what's known as a type 2 civilization. Now, for your own interest, I suspect most of you suspect this, that you are all members of the zero-zero type civilization. <laughs> Beyond us, hopefully in a century or two, we might become a type one. But this is a representation of the type two civilization. And uh, Michio Kaku, the famous Japanese-American physicist in New York, has put out this concept about type 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the kind of advanced cultures and civilizations we will probably meet out there. Well, in probably meet out there, we've already met them. They're here. They're in our midst. So, I think this, I, I brought about 15 or 20 of these pictures, but I simply had no time. I don't have the time to show them all. <clears throat> But I've shown a few here, and I think I've piqued your curiosity. And I think most of you are pretty bright people, and you know you've been conned. You know you've been lied to. You're not fools. And I think you know who you are, and why you're here, and where you're going. Next photograph, please. Ah, this is a photograph taken by our Mariner space vehicle that we launched back a number of years ago. This is a picture of a facility on the surface of Mars. Now, this facility is located on the equator, and it's on the surface. And those of us who have studied it, we, we discuss it with each other, call it the airport. Uh, and I said, this is the parking lot. This is the administration building here. <laughs> this is the main terminal here. And I imagine it's a pretty busy facility, you know, ships coming and going. But it's not an airport, it's very likely a spaceport. It is on the surface and it's on the equator of Mars. And if you're ever interested in launching a vehicle from a planet, you put it on the equator and you take advantage of the rotation of the planet to assist in the, the launching of your vehicle. You can take the momentum of the movement of the planet and it helps you get the thing off the ground. So it's exactly on the equator, it's on the surface, and it's massive inside. So maybe that is the part of I don't know. Maybe that's the admin building, but I, there's something going on on Mars. And I've been going back and forth with Richard Hoagley now for years. 
where Richard, who I know most of you are aware of, is convinced that Mars is covered with ruins. Well, it is. But it's not just ruins. There are things going on on that planet. On the surface, under the surface, continuously. Next picture, please. Ah, this was published in a German magazine. But this is a Soviet photo. This is from their uh, Phobos II spacecraft. This is a city under the surface of Mars that is the size of Chicago. Chicago is one of our biggest cities. Several million people live in Chicago. This is under the surface. You can see the city block. You can see the breakdown here, portions of the neighborhoods, whatever it is. But it's generated an generating an enormous amount of heat. And they picked this up on the infrared when Phobos was going around the planet and snapping pictures like crazy. And the Soviets were pretty open about releasing some of their photos, contrary to the United States, where lying has become a fine art. Don't get me started on my, my politicians. Phobos II, city on Mars, under the surface, you can see the streets, Broadway, First Avenue, whatever you know. <clears throat> People have said, well, who was there? And I said, for God's sake, it's the Martians who were there. <clears throat> what a silly question to ask. Who was there? <laughs> Let's go there. Now, I love this picture. I'm in love with this lady. You're my ancestors and mine called her Gaia. She was feminine. She was a goddess. She was sacred. This beautiful lady has a respiratory system. She has a circulatory system. And she has a heart. And she's our source of life on this planet. We needed her. We need her now. We wouldn't be here if it were not for her. We talk about holy lands, Mecca, Jerusalem, here, there, everywhere. That is the holy land, people. It's that beloved planet that we are home. into another species, into another race. And if you remember your own adolescence, it was a painful time. The species, the race, is going through adolescence. But we're not alone. We're being helped. We have family out there that's helping us. And they've been helping us for a long time. They've been trying to encourage us and nourish us and try to point the right direction for us to go. Because we are troublesome adolescent children. And we are going through the transformation. 
But my point is that there is no doubt about the inevitable destiny and truth of the human race. Now, I want to quote something from you, if you'll bear with me here. One of my favorite authors, poets, was a man I have admired for years, Count Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy said that there is something in the human spirit that will survive and will prevail. That will survive and prevail, and if there is a tiny and brilliant light burning brightly in the heart of man that will not go out no matter how dark the world becomes. And then in the years ahead, when things are difficult, the economic problems take place, there will still be disruptions, fear. Oh, sadly enough, I'm afraid there will still be blood in the streets. Here, there, and everywhere. This coming out of adolescence is not an easy process. <clears throat> but then, what do you do when you reach beyond adolescence? <clears throat> you reach adulthood. You grow up. And we're growing up. <clears throat> well, ladies and gentlemen, my, my journey is coming to an end. But for many of you out there, your journey has just begun. And I want to say something to you before I leave the stage this afternoon. <clears throat> no matter how dark the world becomes, we are keep sure as Paul said, so there is a spark, there is a flame burning in your heart that will never go out. No matter how dark the world becomes. And as my journey is coming to a close, and some of you, your journey is just beginning, I wanted to say to you, and a term that I think is absolutely appropriate, the Steve Sanders has got some beautiful terms in the world. Vaya con Dios. something he'd like to say to Bob. 
about Mars. About Mars. I just, um, I don't have any words, but Bob has expressed everything that I would have said. He's, I can confirm it because I've been working in top secret for 30 years above top secret. We've shared a common background, but I just met him recently here. And I can only say that, yes, there's life on Mars. There are bases on Mars. I've been there. Am I still broadcasting you? You're still here? I'm going to ask you. I was going to share a small story with you before I ran out of time. I'm going to ask the gentleman to please bear with me and give me just a few moments. I attended my son's retirement ceremony in Washington, D.C. in November. My boy retired in November in Washington as a full captain of the United States Navy after 30 years of service. And while I was at this retirement party, the room was filled with admirals and generals and retired commanders and captains and so on. And we all had something cool in our hands and we were all moving around among each other. Amy, really relaxed, you know. <clears throat> a retired Navy scientist, whose name must remain <laughs> untold, came up to me, nudged me. He said, I know you. I said, yes, I'm Eric's father. No, 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 he said, I know you. You're that notorious retired command sergeant major with the big mouth. <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm, I'm over that. He says, I had to share something with you before the party was over. He said, I retired several years ago. He said, my last job was at a government laboratory in Nevada, a few miles from Las Vegas. He said, I am a plasma fusion physicist. That's my expertise, that's my training, my background, and I'm you know, not being a scientist, I go, what, what, plasma fusion physicist? 
He said, yeah, I work. This is what I raised outside of Las Vegas. He says, it's not commonly known, but it's a real secret. He says, I worked five years with two guys who were not from here. They were from somewhere else. And he says, they were delightful people. They were scientists. They were working with us. They were assisting us. They were encouraging us and offering us ideas and possibilities and one thing or another in plasma fusion, which is infinite energy forever. But he says, I got to know them pretty well. And he says, after a couple of years, he said, I, I went up to one of them and I said, what do you guys really think of what human beings? And this chap from somewhere said, well, since you've asked, <laughs> we think you are a, how did they word it? A primitive, savage, and dangerous race. <laughs> and the scientist said, I had to agree with him. We are. We're a primitive, savage, and dangerous race at the moment. The other chap was standing there, who had been listening in. He was also from somewhere. He said, you also smell that. <laughs> <laughs> you humans stink. In the personal mind, you know. We find that you don't smell good. <laughs> and the scientist said, you know, my first thought was, you know, I, I didn't spray out of my arms this morning to make you. And then they tried to explain that we humans had a, a psychic odor about us that they pick up and they find it terribly offensive. So they, they, hit me to be in the eyes because when I was a boy growing up, my grandmother used to say, if we could only see ourselves as others see us, it would help so much to develop our integrity and our character and all that. And this that remark from my grandmother hit me, that this, we, we were getting this so-called from a horse's mouth, from one of our extended family out there that you're primitive, savage, and you're dangerous, but you also stink. And I thought that was humorous, and I shared it with Gogo, and she said, please include that in your presentation. So Gogo, bless your heart, I did that for you. you know? <laughs> Good night, everybody.
without there being at least one and generally two of the others in the audience. And I wanted you all to think about that and look around you and know that in your midst, I quickly refer to it, you have good friends in high places and they're in your midst. And I learned over the years to recognize it. It's your family. Exactly. But in like Ingo Swan, I developed the intuitive ability to spot them and recognize them. And now I have them coming up to me in conferences, introducing themselves to me. And uh, there are no limits, no limits. Life is infinite and forever. And God bless all of you. And I will say goodnight.